Hello and welcome to the Home Assistant Podcast. This is episode 2021.5. My name's Phil. Joining me as usual, I have Rohan. Good morning. Hello, how's it going? This episode is sponsored by Home Assistant Cloud by Nabucasa. Easily access your local Home Assistant instance remotely for a small monthly fee that supports the Home Assistant project. Configuration is done by the user interface, so there's no fiddling with router settings, SSL certificates, or any YAML. This episode is sponsored by morebeer.com. For over 25 years, they've helped creative people like you create your own beer, wine, or coffee at home. Find out more at morebeer.com. Listeners of the show can save $10 off their first order using promo code HASPODCAST. That's H-A-S-S podcast in one word. All right, 2021.5 new features are here. Some of the uh, the highlights we've got from you from the release notes, uh, this release. So slow components are now being highlighted during startup. A lot of work has gone in uh, over the past few releases we've seen uh, around, especially since... Uh, I think one of the pain points before being able to reload automations and stuff was slow restart times for Home Assistant. You know, every time you change an automation or a YAML file, you would have to restart Home Assistant and, you know, it would take a while. Um, then they introduced, you know, the ability to reload you know, YAML without restarting Home Assistant, which has been awesome. And then they updated that the Home Assistant front end would come up first. And while everything in the back end was still loading, you would get, you know, your little yellow bar yeah. saying home assistant is loading please hold so that can actually take it up quite some time uh mm-hmm. so uh depending on which components you've loaded and i know i've discussed this previously on the podcast before but i actually run several instances of home assistant for this reason and one of those instances is just purely dedicated to cloud connected components so anything that relies on the cloud to connect uh to home assistant is on a separate instance uh, and I find that they are generally the slowest components to load. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, you know, like my um, my weather service, uh, I've got some blind controllers that are, you know, require the internet, um, anything basically that has to come in via the internet, those components get loaded in through there. And that instance takes, you know, quite some time to, to restart. So it'll be good to finally be able to tell which components are causing the slowness and you know then i can i guess talking about analytics recently with home assistant you know they've started highlighting which components are being used now i can highlight internally for my own stuff which are my slowest components and then you know put them on a priority list to get replaced interesting so So, uh, how how do have you seen it yet how does it get displayed like is it just like a notification that comes up or is there like a chart that says hey here's the time fill of how long each component or took to load or so to be fair i uh i don't practice what i preach and all that (laughs) i my cloud instance is uh i rarely update that uh to the bleeding edge um so that's where I'd want to like check this out. So I haven't seen it uh, where it matters yet. Yeah. But my my main instance where I've upgraded to uh, is pretty snappy, and I haven't had to see this message yet. So I'm not sure where it's displayed. I assume it is going to be uh, like either a, a toast somewhere. There is going to be screenshots in the release notes on uh, homeassistant.io. So uh, whatever I'm talking about now will obviously get you know updated yeah. there. But uh, I think it's either yeah, it'll be somewhere in the UI, or at least there will definitely should be a log about it too. Yeah, I hope I hope at least because I mean I think it'd be pretty cool to be able to just stack rank my my integrations even right. So mm. um, from from worst to best or whatever, uh, and and yep. say you know okay this this takes a long period of time and and I want to make sure that again like you said either replace this or you know open a bug or, or do something around that, right? Or, or try and maybe yep. try myself to investigate why is it taking so long? Maybe it's just me in my instance that's taking so long, yep. whatever, right? So I think that'd be kind of cool to, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm personally really curious to see how that, uh, how that looks. I think for quite some time there has been a like a warning or something in the Home Assistant log, you know, saying, oh, you know, component X is taking seconds. more than 10 yeah. seconds to load or something like that. So I assume it's it must be brought into the front end just to highlight that a bit easier. 
Interesting. Okay, so maybe maybe that's what it is. Because in my mind, I was thinking it's a, it's like like you know how in like Firefox, if you're trying to do like if you go into the web console and start to see okay what components are okay. taking long to load on this website or whatever, and it, and it times that. So I was I was thinking yeah, maybe yeah. something like that. But yeah, you might be right. So and it's definitely not going to block Home Assistant. So the idea being that you know they'll just let you know this component is taking a while. This is why Home Assistant yeah. isn't ready yet. And then once it's finished, as usual, you're instance will come back up yeah that makes sense some other improvements um recorder performance and the database updates so that is actually really nice to see um i know the recorder component a lot of times is what actually ends up being slow um to Mm. to load right and and i know for a fact that if uh, because i i moved mine off and moved it to sql so if my sql my 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 sql server isn't up yet it basically just grinds to a halt and uh and until eventually it times out and gives up um so i'm i'm glad to see that there's some performance improvements in recorder hopefully that's around how it uh also loads rather than just in general but it sounds like they've also done mm-hmm. a bunch of upgrades in terms of how it uh, how it performs as a whole in terms of actually recording each line that it needs to record, right? So it sounds like uh, it doesn't write as frequently, which uh, hopefully is a good thing and, and gives it a bit more of a performance boost and gives some of that CPU or I.O. back. I, I, think this is, I think this is going to be awesome because I have a lot of entities just from random like devices, yeah. right? Like think all the stuff we have, like I've got you know, motion sensors in every room that also report light levels and temperatures. Um, Rohan, I think you're still using the Xiaomi plant sensors that come in via Bluetooth, right? Like every single time one of those devices gets updated, it's going to be, it was previously doing a hit to your database, right? So it's yeah. writing to your disk. So uh, the fact that, you know, they're going to reduce uh, the number of times the record component needs to write to disk is, yeah, that alone should be a bit of a, a performance yeah, exactly. improvement. And- I think even like, and I've gotten to the point where I've taken off, like within an integration, I've turned off certain things. So for example, the, I won't say her name, but the Amazon Echo Media Player integration, uh, which which I love, yep. but I, I've, there's a bunch of components in there I just don't use um, per, per Echo that I mm-hmm. have. So like the position of the uh, do not disturb switch or whatever again yep. those kind of things i i personally my automation i don't use so i've just removed it flat out just so that that's less yep. things that it needs to keep track of and, and hopefully improve the performance as well right just on the amazon echo don't disturb it's interesting that you don't use that like why, that's one of my favorite automations for the the media player component like yeah so i was actually going to bring that one back in because what i was finding is because before i was actually looking at it as mm-hmm. if i have a switch turned on yeah uh like a, like a virtual it's a binary sensor that it turned on in home assistant then play the sounds otherwise don't yes yep right but uh but it <laughs> you know again that because in my head i'm thinking the world revolves around me so anytime i open the door or close the door or whatever but what happens is amazon you know i get a package and my notification goes off and i'm in a customer meeting or something and you just see that exactly loop. yeah right so um so I, I i am actually planning on bringing that one back in but uh <laughs> good, good call out though <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's and that was my total use case all right i got my family you know the amazon echoes for yeah. during lockdown you know so we could call each other and of course, they would call at inconvenient times during work days and all that yeah. uh, podcast recording. So yeah, as part of the, you know, even just as part of this podcast recording routine, you know, like I tell a little lady, you know, that we we're about to record a podcast and she goes ahead and puts all the echoes around the house and do not disturb. Um, same if my Google calendar says I'm working from home and it's, you know, during work hours, uh, do not disturb is flipped on in my office so that, you know, if I'm on a, a call, um, that doesn't happen. I am thinking of even, you know, going down a bit fine tuning it a bit so i think the i haven't installed it yet but there is the mac os app for home assistant which can detect if your camera is being used right uh i believe that was a feature that was that's promised i'm, I'm hoping it's there it just comes in as a sensor to home assistant so that if my camera is on then i'm obviously in a meeting so you know once again flick that on yeah uh, i i actually built a uh again without using the do not disturb i'm for my binary sensor mm. Um, I've actually got that being triggered by my status on uh, my present status on WebEx. So basically, if it says I'm in a call, I'm presenting, uh, anything like that, it actually automatically flips it on uh, for me. Which that's cool. So it's pretty, it's pretty handy. I know, I know a few people have also done that independently of of me or talking to each other. And I was talking to a couple of people. Yeah. Oh, I do this too. 
It's like, okay, so everybody's had the same uh, look <laughs> and feel or same idea concept. My most recent venture has been into, I've started to try and so my condition logic in automations is getting out of mm-hmm. control, right? Like I just have so many and or branches going on. So I'm trying to move a lot of my conditions into like binary sensors, like template binary yeah. sensors. And so one of those things that I've done now is like a, a binary sensor for whether or not announcements should be, you know, sent around the yeah. house. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like, is it between, you know, is it daylight? Am I in a podcast recording? Am I, is it a work day during work hours? And then as long as, you know, once all those template conditions have been evaluated um, and that will dictate whether or not the house can, you know, basically send out a, a global announcement. Still fine tweaking it, but I think, those sort of ways might be better than all this condition logic that I have to copy around yeah. to all the different automation places. Yeah, and, and that's a nice thing, right? Like, so I have my, I have an automation basically to flip my, turn off that binary sensor after 5 p.m., but at the same time, I might still be on because mm-hmm. I, I cover multiple time zones. So even though it's 5 yep, p.m. Yep. my time in Pacific Coast or, or, or in the prairies, it might be 3 p.m. or in the Pacific Coast, it might be uh, 2 p.m., right? So again, I might still be on calls. So basically what happens is it, it's a, I just, I just get it to check once a minute. So even though, okay, mm-hmm. great, 5 p.m. it's triggered and then 5.01, it'll go in and actually look and check my WebEx status again. And hey, it says Rohan's on a call. Great. I'm going to make sure that I turn that back on. So technically, I guess right. I have a period okay. of potentially up to 60 seconds or, or one minute, whatever that uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I guess, in a, in a state where. That's not true. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's I'm, acceptable yeah. risk, right? I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, one thing I'd like to have, that they've done with the uh, record performance too um, is the database updates now don't block Home Assistant from loading. Yes. So previously, if they had uh, like a big database upgrade, which I believe 2021.5 has, remember it might be a huge upgrade, right. but there is a database migration at least, uh, you would just have to sit in limbo waiting for Home Assistant to do its upgrade. Is it working? Is it not working? Yeah, um, yeah so... Uh, that is good to yeah, see. Yeah, I've never had it fail, but I have had it take a very long time, especially when before I moved it to MySQL and I was using just, uh, I guess, just, I guess a text file that it uses, right, for NoSQL or whatever by default. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, and that, that can take a very long time. So I'm very happy to see that too. Yeah, that's awesome. So there's a new look for the integration dashboard, I believe. the So if you've started using the UI to manage your integrations in Home Assistant, you'll notice the big cards. Um, and they should now be a lot slimmer. And there's a, so there's a brand new look. And the integrations will now uh, highlight those that rely on the cloud. There will be a little cloud icon in that page and if it's using a custom component so if you've either installed something through hacks or uh, you've created a custom component just for yourself there will also be a little package icon in that uh, integrations list so good to see some love coming around into these little user settings yeah it's really nice i just i just opened it up as you were talking there phil and and I, i actually like the smaller size um I just think, yep. again, before it was massive and, and it wasn't really giving me a ton of information. Yeah. So why is it taking that much space? Um, I really like yep. this and and I like the fact that, hey, you know, Ecobee uses a cloud, whereas ESP Home doesn't, right? Like, I, I like the I like the delineation yep. there. You can tell right by looking. And anything that's failed to set up is highlighted in red. Um, again, like custom, uh, custom packages and whatnot. So that's really nice to see. Yeah, that's excellent. Also, Docker images. So now uh, the Docker images are hosted on the GitHub container registry. So you can, you know, you can choose to go from there or you can still use Docker Hub, um, which is what it was before. Um, That's what I use and it's fine. So I don't really need to change anything. But it's nice to know that, you know, you can use the GitHub registry. I'm sure at some point they might cut it over rather than having to maintain two different places or whatever. But I hope they don't. I think, you know, the standard Docker Hub which comes, you know, pre-installed yeah. with all Docker installations is it would be better to use. But, you know, I'm sure there's a, a reason behind it. I think there's also, they've added in some uh, security checking as well to container images. So if you do use the GitHub container registry, there is a way that you can validate that the container you're pulling from Home Assistant is mm. verified as well. So if you've got like a, a CI CD process for your home assistant infrastructure at home, then you could probably put that into the mix as well. Just, just give yourself a little bit of, you know, just backing yourself up. Yeah. You're getting the 
not like somebody's modified it and done something malicious, whatever. It, that's exactly right. Because I think there's a bit of uh, focus on yeah. security at the moment. You know, potentially, you know, as home business grows and it gets more popular, the, you know, malicious people are out there. They might try and, you know, distribute uh, a malicious version of home assistant that's designed, yep. you know, to spy on you or sniff traffic along your local network and gain access to your systems that way. So I yep. think that no, makes agreed. perfect sense. Uh, something else coming into Home Assistant this release. So restarting a Home Assistant will now display why it isn't restarting. So if you've ever pressed the restart button in Home Assistant and it just won't restart, the button will now give you feedback as to why Home Assistant can't restart. Uh, it's most likely due towards a broken config. Um, you know, like if you've got a YAML syntax error somewhere, if Home Assistant was to restart, then... Uh, right. It just would come back with an error anyway. So restarts uh, should now also be a bit faster. I believe the, during this month, the team went through the top 35 integrations that are being used by the Home Assistant community, and they were audited to ensure that they restart as quickly as possible. So for everyone that's activated their analytics on Home Assistant, thank you very much. You are directly contributing oh, to a faster fancy. Home like Assistant. That. Yeah, Yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, one thing that, and this is what I, maybe it's just a, a Docker thing, but, you know, the, the reset button never worked for me in Docker. I just assume it's a Docker thing, right? And that's why I created HA Docker Mod. I'd like to, for me, to have the ability to remotely, you know, with a, a web yeah. URL just to uh, restart a Docker container. So I'm glad to see that the reset button actually gives feedback to people because I think that's a pain point. It was a pain point for me, right? Like I'd be hitting that reset button for a while. Yeah. So, so, so there's, there's, I mean, especially in this context, there's, there's two restarts, right? One is restarting home assistant mm -hmm. as an application. And one is restarting the entire container as a whole. Right. So, I mean, I, cause I know I use yep. the, uh, I actually just created like a services portal. So just like a monitoring portal, just so I can see, you know, what's going on with home assistant. Oh, is there nice. anything messed up or anything like that? Right. Like, so like right now I'm looking and my, uh, what's it called? My my Zigbee adapter just didn't come online for some reason, which is great. Uh, but in there, I have a restart services uh, button there too, right? So when I restart the system, it just calls home assistant yep. restart or whatever, which is the application. Uh, but but I do find that that doesn't always work either. Sometimes I can yeah, smash yeah. that a few times and it still doesn't doesn't work. Um, so mm. it'd be nice to see why that's the case. I have a feeling also that because uh, home assistant is you know tied to the the Docker command, like if home yeah. if home assistant app restarts in that container, then technically the whole container needs to close down anyway, right? Does it though? I, I don't believe it does. I might be wrong, but yeah, and no, I'm pretty sure. Like, it, I would have to see the Docker file. I haven't looked at the Home Assistant Docker file in quite some time, and I'm sure someone more knowledgeable will yeah. talk to me about it. Um, but you know, I'm uh, when like the application inside the Docker container crashes, um, it, the whole container dies, right? So in a Docker context, I guess. Um, it would make sense why the, the reset yeah. wouldn't work. Uh, so the services thing that you've created is that like are you using any software to do that, or is that something? No, that it's just it's just I, I guess I, I guess I mis misrepresented that. It, it, it's basically just a little another um, page in Lovelace that I have that just gives me you know yep. uptime breaking changes. So I know if it's crashed or whatever. Nice, nice. Any uh, any updates on hacks? Any updates on on home assistant itself uh, and then what yep. like all of my pertaining docker services that i run right so because i run everything independently so home assistant itself mqtt mysql which just restarted as i'm looking at it uh so you can see it works <laughs> uh yeah node red that kind of stuff right so i have all. yeah nice actually because uh, I, I was thinking i was going to say to you why aren't you just using yeah. a lovelace view sorry yeah that, that, that yeah, is what i'm doing i've actually yeah I've, I've taken it to the next level and um so I, obviously I've got multiple instances, which means they're running on multiple hosts. And so I've started using um, like port scanning from one machine to another to determine if a container is right. up on. So right now, like, for example, um, I've got, um, you know, like sonar, LiDAR, radar running behind a VPN uh, in mm -hmm. my Synology NAS. And if the VPN container goes offline, they lose access to the internet. Everything right? dies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those containers go down. So when the VPN reconnects, uh, they don't have access to the network anymore. But from a Docker perspective, they're up, they're healthy, they're running perfectly. So now what I've done is I've got 
uh, home assistant and it goes through and it checks um, all the ports that I have in my uh, compose file. I roughly have to do them manually, but you know, it goes in and just sees, right, is this port open? Can I connect to it? Um, is, you know, Grafana online? Is my SQL online? Um, and that way it just becomes a binary sensor in Home Assistant. And if it detects, you know, all of a sudden, oh, I can't access that port anymore, it can then use HA Docomon to go out and do a container restart on those. Or it will send me an alert on my phone saying, hey, this container is offline. It shouldn't be. You need to go in and see what's up with it. So I haven't looked to see if there's a integration for it, but HTTP ping is um, can kind of do that, where it basically, I, it, it essentially just runs a, it tries to create an HTTP, tra- not a transaction, but basically yep. what it does is try to create an HTTP connection to that service. But can um, it do it on a specific port, though? I don't think so it th- couldn't. Like, like, you mean like how Home Assistant runs on 8123 as an example? Yeah, like exactly. Default. I yeah. don't. I don't see why it couldn't. But so I believe, um, like, when you're doing like a ping, it's just doing like a certain port that is just saying, "Is this host online?" Get well, a ping is just ICMP that it uses, right? So it's just a yeah. standard. Yeah. Um, but this, it looks like you can do port. Uh, yeah. So it's like because in the example, they just say like your host colon eighty eighty. So so yeah, you can totally do ports. Oh, interesting. All right. Well, um, I am doing some yeah very random. Uh, curl calls, um, yeah. all using uh, like command line centers, binary sensors, just to go out and see. And so I've also started extending that around. So um, I have the Plex service running on the Synology, nice. which I've noticed randomly will um, go offline. Yeah. Right. Um, and also like just because, and I've, I've had to take it to another level in that just because I can access 32400, which is the Plex port through the web browser, doesn't mean it finishes loading. So I've I've had to start doing yeah. some crazy, you know, um, curl calls, you know, timeout checks um, and all that. It's just because the port's open doesn't mean that the page will uh, finish loading. So I've got all that running in Home Assistant now. So then, you know, a problem binary sensor gets raised um, and I've got a uh, SSH uh, shell command that will log into the Synology NAS uh, and execute a package restart service. I haven't got that working completely yet, but at least it's it's almost there. Nice. That is actually really cool. I might I might steal some of that from you at some point. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll leave um, some code in the in the show notes yeah. for anyone that's interested. I think I think that might um, be interesting for more than just me too. Yeah. Yeah, because it's yeah just awesome. Like uh, the last thing I want to do is turn the TV on and go into Plex and it says nothing's available. Yeah. And then I have to get up. It becomes a whole issue. Or if it's my wife that wants to watch TV, of course it's at the most inconvenient time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as as quicker I can get, you know, notified that there is a problem that I can fix it before someone else notices the better. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. So that's been, I've just been adding binary sensors and curl calls everywhere. It's been awesome. That's cool. Yeah. I might steal that and add it to my, to my status page. Yeah, definitely. My systems page, whatever you want to call it. I actually have a couple of cool things in there too. Like I have like a, I don't know, something that I, because at some point my I was having issues with notifications and I was testing it obviously at like three mm. in the morning when my partner she was sleeping and then the notification <laughs> went off and that didn't work out too well for me. No, I bet. So yeah, so now I have I can actually I, I can trigger test notifications, but it's behind like a locked button <laughs> that I have to press uh, it for three you... seconds and then it pops up going, "Are you sure?" <laughs> and then uh and then uh yeah i can do that That's awesome. and i have that for the uh, amazon echoes as well so it's kind of kind of fun yeah. yeah yeah all right let's talk about some integrations um so some of the newer integrations that are come in uh first one is it's not really i guess it's not an integration but it's an improvement to one is uh google's text-to-speech so there's some more uh google tts languages that are available um as in all of them that are now available to you uh, that home assistant can consume. So that's actually really nice to see. Mm, uh, something that we talked about back in uh, 2021.3, uh, which was the Rituals Perfume Genie integration. Yeah. Uh, I love this integration. <laughs> um, it, uh, it was just obviously that oil diffuser or oil, like it just makes your house smell nicely in a smart way. Yeah. Right? Um, I believe we've asked for a free sample and rituals have yet to come That's back right. to us. But we don't. I don't <laughs> go six. Um, so they've added uh, a lot of new sensors to this release. So there's a binary sensor to indicate if the battery is charging. 
and there's also a sensor to say what type of perfume is currently in there and the amount of perfume available so here's a fun fact for everyone thanks to the new analytics that being run 0.1 percent of home assistant installations are using this integration and so therefore we have just wasted your time for the 0.1 percent of people <laughs> that have this integration but uh i think this does highlight you know just the powerfulness of powerfulness is that a word just the the power i think this does highlight the power of home assistant in that you know it's the community that is building home assistant and just because you know there's you know literally you know 0.1 percent of people out there that have this component installed doesn't mean that it doesn't you know it's not active you know ser- clearly you know these sensors are useful to at least yeah. someone um and you know thank you to whoever is contributing to this because this is just great to give back to the community and it, it you know and in terms of the company rituals, you know, it certainly put uh, them on the map for myself. Ditto. So, you know, in, in the future, uh, you know, just the fact that there is this home assistant integration, uh, you know, is it's great. interesting. Sounds like they, they do like a cartridge based thing. Uh, sorry, I'm completely digressing yeah. right now as, I, as I'm currently <laughs> looking at the perfume genie. Uh <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's the model, right? Like uh, a printer model, make it a cheap printer and then charge them on the the cartridges. Uh, Some other new cool integrations. Um, So Sonos speakers. So if you use the Sonos Move speaker as an example, which is a portable speaker from Sonos, uh, now because it's a portable speaker, it has batteries. That battery support is now uh, brought in to Home Assistant. Nice. I think it's also a binary sensor, uh, similar to that Rituals one that says, you know, is it charging or not? Nice. that might be good for adding automation yeah. to as well, right? Uh, Motion Eye. Uh, we've talked about Motion Eye before. It's been pretty mm-hmm. popular. Like, there's a lot of people using Motion Eye, um, but there is now uh, you can now integrate your Motion Eye server into Home Assistant. Um, so that will become uh, like a proper integration. So yeah, good to see that. Ron, how's your uh, imaging going? Uh, if you're detecting your delivery men, have you? done any work on that it's uh, it's exactly where i left off the last time you asked me which is the container's running it's that's, definitely consuming power and i've done absolutely nothing <laughs> towards it so yeah that's why i wouldn't expect anything more from you it's there it's right though my deep stack container is monitored on my status page <laughs> why <laughs> i don't know but it's there ah perfect progress progress <laughs> i like it um decons decons now has uh support for alarm control panels or sorry Using decons, you can now, a home assistant now has support for alarm uh, control panels. Um, so there's also support for device triggers, so things like IKEA, or sorry, Xiaomi wall switches, the IKEA stir bar, um, all that kind of stuff. So, which is actually really nice to see if you use the decons integration. Mm. That IKEA stir bar switch, I, uh, I've only just, it must be a new switch or something. I've um, never seen it before, but I, I believe it's, um, designed either for lights or something because i think it's got brightness yeah, it control does. on it as well it must be like a, a button based um zb button so yeah really cool i was previously using their um uh they've got the they look like radio dials but they're designed for their um yes blind controllers so that you turn it like volume up volume down you can push it um i've got that integrated um as well to do actually they're not designed for their blind controls they're designed for music i should say but i am using them to control my blinds so that you do like a volume down the blinds go down volume up the blinds go up sort of thing so yeah i I really like these ikea zigbee switches like pretty good quality yeah your 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 blinds aren't ikea blinds are they no 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 yeah okay so so okay so you're just bringing it all into home assistant and home assistant is just yeah, exactly. Using that as a knob, essentially, yeah. or, or as a physical slider, yeah. equivalent of a slider in, in ads. The only thing I don't like is that when you change the dial, that mm-hmm. it's not, uh, you know, like if you're changing the the volume on a radio, as you turn the dial down, yeah. the sound would go down, right? Doesn't uh, happen instantly enough for me, Um so that right. you know, you only you like you'll get like you'll flick the dial, home misses will get you know, oh, it's moved X percent or something like that, and then home misses will then have to go in and move whatever to that percentage, right? So it's not like you don't get that f- instant feedback. So there's like half a second delay or whatever. Yeah, it, potentially even more depending on you know yeah, if, yeah, if yeah. the battery device has to wake up and all that. Mm. But. You know, these are just things that you can live with. I think that's why when they're paired natively with the Sonos 
um, speakers that come from Ikea, they yeah. work instantly um, because they have, you know, like that tight integration. Whereas with these, I'm going through decons and then back out into home assistant and then back out to the third-party device at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it depends on how fast or slow decons is processing it. What yeah, else exactly. is going on? Home assistant is a recorder doing a thousand things. Yep, yep, yep. Am I Whatever. streaming something from Plex and, you know, consuming my yeah. bandwidth? Yeah. Uh, so picnic integration. So for those in the Netherlands, you can now see information in Home Assistant about your picnic delivery orders, including deliveries and cart contents. Uh, so I think, yeah, picnic, I think we were talking to Paulus about this um, uh, like offline in one of the episodes. It's a pretty cool service out in the Netherlands. Uh, but yeah, uh, for those people in the Netherlands, you now have that. Uh, and I'm very jealous that you can see your contents and delivery status in Home Assistant. <laughs> that's right. That, that's where I'm looking for, for my, uh, what did I order? Yeah. Some uh, breaking changes. So a few integrations moving away from YAML to the UI. So again, we've we've seen this across quite a few releases now where, where they are moving to a lot of these, uh, moving to the UI first. So a few of those integrations that are moving over, um, Google Maps travel time, Waze travel time, on phase envoy, I, I, I am probably butchering that, but sorry, <laughs> that's what you get for naming it. Um, Easy Viz, SMA Solar, AVM Fritz Box tools. So I don't know what half of these are. I know the Google Maps and Waze uh, travel time. I've actually heard of on phase as well. So that's cool. Um, but if you use those, um, you'll probably want to bring it into the UI at some point. Yeah. I think for most of them, they will just auto upgrade into the UI and then yes. just remove them from YAML. Yeah, exactly. And and I believe the the logger will actually tell you, like if you actually look at your logs at some point, it'll yeah. uh, it'll say, hey, you're not using this component anymore. So it's ignoring it or whatever. So um, yeah. I don't know. I like to keep it clean if I can. So The recollect waste integration uh, is now uh, using pickup dates stored as UTC timestamps. So if you're using the states or the attributes of those directly in your automations, you will need to adjust for the updated time zones. So they will be now in UTC time as opposed to the local time of wherever it is. Uh, it should be easy enough to then convert that in home assistant, either using a template or something else. Growl, if you use Growl for notifications, so GNTP as well as you know, what's called. Um, so if you use that integration, it has been deprecated and it's going to be removed uh, from Home Assistant in 2021.6. That's the next release. So um, yeah, at that point, move off of Growl. I believe that whole project has shut down, which is sad to see. And it was pretty popular. Yeah, I, I, I haven't followed it, but uh, it is sad to see. I used to use it back in the day for notifications mm -hmm. of like, you know, whatever. Hey, this thing downloaded or whatever, right? So I think, yeah, if you are looking for something uh, that you can use for notifications, Home Assistant have a whole bunch of notification platforms from Facebook Messenger, Push Bullet, all that. But even the Home Assistant apps, you know, I, I was mentioning before yeah. the Mac OS app for Home Assistant. And that's another reason I would want to install that app is just to have the ability to have notifications come in uh, into my Mac on my screen as opposed to my phone. As a, so, yeah, yeah, definitely replacements for Yeah, it. exactly. Uh, Echo B climate devices will change the reported temperature precision to their current temperature attribute from whole degrees to a 0 0.1 degree increment. Automations which rely on whole number precision may need to be adjusted. So yeah, you may need, if you're doing like above or below, or, you know, um, if the temperature is at this exact temperature, then you may need to adjust your automations. Um, but yeah, I think 0 0.1 degree increments makes sense get a little bit more fancier yeah and i think that is 2021.5 um Ron, any other quick wins you've had this month before we no, go i mean it's pretty pretty standard as it is just nothing really going on nothing really changing nothing really whether it's home assistant or anything else <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I got That's hopefully it. people notice i got i got a new mic set up so i don't know if you can tell the difference but hopefully you can yeah let us know we'll if our hand doesn't sound as good, that's we'll, right. we'll replace him. <laughs> that's right. It's the easiest solution here. <laughs> we've, got, we've, got, we've got a new microphone. If it, if it doesn't sound any better now, we'll just have to replace the, the host. That's it. That's right. That's right. So that, that's the that's the only win I have. And that was because my microphone stand was falling apart. So I decided to buy a new mic too. So <laughs> Fantastic. Perfect. All right. All right. We'll see you guys soon. Take care. 
If you want to share your home assistant journey or come on as a guest, reach out to us at feedback at haspodcast.io. That's H-A-S-S podcast.io. The Home Assistant Podcast is hosted by Phil Hawthorne and myself, Rohan Karamandi. For links to topics that we discussed today, check out our show notes on haspodcast.io. Thank you.